Hey everybody, it's Brian with Harvest Community Church, and um, I want to just address something for you today. So many of you have reached out and asked about reopening. You've asked in our care groups, you've reached out to our staff or our stewards, you've reached out to me and asked about reopening. And I think the greatest question we sort of get at this point is something along this lines. I want to see if I can sum it up. The question goes like this. Some other churches are beginning to open back up in some form or fashion, and we haven't yet. And so the question becomes, why can other churches open back up and we can't, at least not yet. And so I want to give you a simple answer and a longer answer, if you will. Uh, let's start with the simple answer. I think it's a great question. I know where you're coming from. I miss you. I miss you deeply. Um, it's so tough not being able to see your faces. But I also know that um, I would address it, I guess, this way. First, our church has really never been closed. Our facility has been closed. But our church hasn't been closed, right? We are the church, the people, and we have been gathering online each week to serve God, to seek his kingdom, and to serve our community together. And so only our facilities have been closed, but our worship has continued to happen. In fact, we're still thinking and praying through uh, the issues about reopening and reentering our facilities but I know this, at right now, what we've approved is for small groups of people, um, if they will uh, just communicate with us about when and how, we've approved for small groups of people to come onto our campus and stay outside in socially distanced ways and meet together. And so in other words, one of our care groups, one of our small groups may want to gather out in the parking lot or in our uh, grass or under our pavilion and um, you know stay socially spread out, physically spread out, and uh, meet together for a bit. We've had had um, an, a, a small group or two do that already, and if you'd like to do that, just let us know uh, so that we can schedule that and uh, make sure the facility or the campus is available for that. Um, it's important to me to remember, we've never really closed. Um, we've just worshipped in different ways in our homes each week. The other thing I would remind you is that every church and every pastor and every staff and every, every group of believers is different. Every leadership team is different. And every situation is different. And yes, we're all facing the same coronavirus, but all of our facilities, all of our circumstances, all of our supplies are all in different statuses. And what I do know is that every pastor I personally know is wrestling deeply with what is best for their church corporately as they gather together and what is best for their people individually. I know this. I don't know everybody else's church. I know you. I love you. I want what's best for you. And my concern is for your family and it's personal. Now, I tell you, I don't live in fear of the coronavirus but neither do I want to do any unnecessary funerals, if that makes sense. What I do know is that we're thinking almost daily about what to do. And every pastor I know is agonizing over this decision. I can promise you that. So a little bit longer an answer. That's the short answer. And that was a couple of minutes, right? A little bit longer of an answer, I'd repeat everything I said in the short answer, and I would add to it that I know we all are longing for some sense of normality, that we're longing for hugs and handshakes and high fives, that we're longing for open worship with no masks and no singing and the building full and the people together. I know we're longing for that. We're longing to see each other's faces and interact together and love on each other, and that's all completely to be expected. But I also know that what we're really longing for is for this impact of this virus to be gone. And there's a reality we still have to face today. Yes, some businesses are beginning to open back up, and yes, some churches are as well. But the virus is still very real and still very much out there. You know, from the earliest of decisions linked to this virus, I have chosen for my decision-making to be guided by certain values that people matter, and so do grace and hope and love. And so if you look back at all we've done in the last many weeks and months, it's been driven by these values, that people matter, 
but so do grace and hope and love. That the mission of Jesus will never be shut down and never be closed. And it's why, among other things, we've so often asked, how are you really doing? It's why we've surveyed you. It's why we've asked your opinions about reopening. In fact, as I looked at the survey results from last week, and we had pretty good participation, a high number of families, I mean, not every family in the church answered, but we had lots of families participate, and we got some really interesting answers. We asked, for instance, about your attitude towards returning to church when local governments begin to lift bans on churches uh, gathering and meeting together. And we fell into thirds, about a third saying, I'm ready to come back it, like three weeks ago, you know, like any given moment. And about a third saying, I might be ready to return if there are precautions in play. And we take some real precautions. And about a third willing to say, you know what, I'm not so sure yet if I'm ready to return. So that was just looking at one question. We asked the same question a slightly different way. And we asked, we asked, uh, I gotta find it. Oh, here it is. All right, as soon as we receive clearance for public gatherings from local officials, which would you prefer for our church? About 30% of you said, I'd prefer to resume in-person worship at our church immediately. Very similar to the last question. About 10% of you said, I'm still undecided. About 19% said, I'd like to keep activities online only to see what happens with the virus. And about 40%, more than 40%, a little more, said, we think we'd like to meet in smaller groups with limited size gatherings for at least a few more weeks before resuming in-person services. That gave us some good input on your thinking. And as you can see, we're all in a different space in our heads and in a different place in our hearts about what to do. In this age of social media, one of the most difficult skills to acquire is to know which voices to listen to. You know, there are a multitude of voices out there and everybody's got an opinion, but not every opinion expresses wisdom, if you will. I am doing my level best to find the wisest voices I can, both inside our church and outside our church, and to listen deeply to what they are saying. Most of what I find on social media, again, is often opinion, but not necessarily wisdom based in fact or training or even experience. Because let's admit this, when businesses and churches open back up, nobody can predict exactly what is gonna happen. I've spent today and many, many days over the last weeks pouring through a variety of articles and research. I've asked questions like, are there new exposures happening in the first churches to reopen? Uh, what exactly are <laughs> aerosolized particles and what does that have to do with singing in church? What must we do to protect our church and our staff, our families, our volunteers when we come back together again? What options do we have indoors and outdoors? There are many factors that have to be considered. The safety and well-being of our families certainly weighs heavily. We also think about the readiness of our families to return, the timing that might make the most sense for Harvest Community Church, the risks to those in our church family who are vulnerable. We have to think about the small size of our worship center and how that limits what can happen. Of course, we have to be aware of the guidelines that have been issued from the government and from other health officials. We have to think about requirements for social distancing, for masks, for gloves, for other cleaning procedures that we need to have in place. We need to to think about what plans we have to minister to the youngest among us who will be with us when we gather together because at least early we're not going to be able to have the classes for the kids and the youngest among us. We have to think about our volunteers and when our volunteers are available and ready and trained. We have to think about how to clean, not only in between, uh, in between the weeks of our services, uh, but we have to think about how to clean in between multiple services so that as one crowd um, goes back home, that the facility is safe for the next group that might come in. We've got to think about the number of services we need, the safety guidelines we have to have in place, and how we communicate all of these plans to every one of you. You know, if we're not meeting, 
in other words, if we're remaining online, then the greatest risk we face as a church is probably disagreement, division, and disunity. And that's a real risk. But when we begin to gather again together, there are great risks there, certainly, as well. In fact, those risks, depending on who you believe, could involve COVID-19 becoming personal for people we know and love. People we know and love who would be impacted, hospitalized, or more. And so these things weigh heavy on my heart, and I don't take this decision about what we do and when we do it and how we do it lightly at all. It has me praying, it has me seeking the Lord, and it has me asking for the greatest of wisdom. Of course, those risks are not an argument for never meeting together because life will always involve risk. But those risks do at least caution us to bring as much wisdom to the table as we possibly can. You know, from the earliest of days linked to the coronavirus, I've treated this season we're in like a long-term mission trip for Harvest Community Church because I don't lead all the other churches out there. I lead us. And so I have thought of this in my mind and in my heart and in my soul as a long-term mission trip for all of our Harvest families both individually and even together. And if you've ever gone on a mission trip, you know a few things. You know that the purpose of the whole trip supersedes your individual purpose. You know that the mission you're on is bigger than any individual's opinion and that the mission has to drive decisions. You know, if you've gone on a mission trip, that we've got to remain fluid and flexible, adapting to the circumstances as they change around us. Flexibility is so important on mission trips. And in this season we're in, flexibility is, it's gold. Because things change so rapidly. I mean, honestly, I could tell you something about August right now, but August so far off, who knows what we face those many weeks down the road or in September or October or Christmas. Nobody can really predict timing because timing on any of this is not guaranteed. I know when we go on mission trips that those of us who are leading think often and daily about how we care for the people who are on the trip that we want everyone on the trip to be healthy, whole, processing, emotionally, spiritually, physically, all that they are experiencing. And we make time every day on those trips to make sure that the team is doing well, that if people need to take a rest to care for their self, physically, or even for their soul, that they do, so that they can go back to serving others quickly. I know this, when we go on mission trips, when we reach the end of the experience, there's always much going on in my heart. And I begin to see things with a new perspective. But one of the new perspectives that is biggest within me when I think about that is the perspective of what God did in me. That the perspective of what God did in me almost always is bigger than the perspective of what God did in the trip or the people or those we served that I so often have walked away and thought, the reason I was there is so I was changed, even though I thought I was going to help change others. And certainly, others experience change along the way, but the question becomes, when you're on one of these trips, what is God doing in my soul right now? And that's a, an approach, seeing this season as a long-term mission trip. It's an approach I would encourage all of us to embrace as we go through this season together. My greatest concerns are big. I am deeply concerned about when we open back up. Certainly I wonder about all of your opinions and what happens. And what happens when? What happens how? And what happens if? I wonder about all of these things. But some of my greatest concerns are bigger than the urgent question of when can we 
gather together again. I'm concerned that we could be deeply divided over what to do and when to do it and the impact that would have on us personally, the impact that would have on us together as a church, and the impact that would have on our witness to the community. I'm concerned that we thrive beyond tomorrow as a church, not just that we reopen today. I'm concerned with our ability and our reputation to continue to serve well in Eugene and Springfield and the southern Willamette Valley. I'm often asking myself questions about how well we are serving you through this season and also how well we're serving all of our neighbors and businesses and friends around us. How well are we serving them with the gospel? I'm asking myself how well we are caring for you through this unique season. I'm asking myself how well we are discipling you and how well we are doing at helping you become more like Christ and grow in your faith in this season. I know this. I don't know all the answers in this moment today. But I do know that we all feel the pressure of the urgent. But I want to remind us to pause and pray long enough to think through the work of the important. And to remember at the end of the day, people really do matter. And so do faith and hope and love. And as the good book says, the greatest of these is love. So know this, we're going to do everything we can to love you well. We're going to do everything we can to love our community well. And as soon as I have answers to any of these questions with physical dates or timelines, I'll make sure that you're the first to know. I love you. Can't wait till I can hug you again, even if that's well beyond months from now. I love you all. I will see you soon.